Um, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, first of all, there. Um, Mike Connerton was talking about, uh, if you have questions about co -o, there's his email address, my email address, and our colleague uh, in the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, Jared Cole. Uh, so it's great to show that update up there. It's really, we're going to talk about alewife primarily, but I also want to just take this opportunity to help uh, catch you guys up on some of the things that we've been learning and thinking about alewife and, and things that actually drive the, the system. Hey, okay, so three topics. First is going to be talking about how Lake Ontario has changed and really continues to change. Then we'll go into a little bit about the alewife biology and how that relates to the survey and how we go about collecting and counting them. And then finally, talk about the status of alewife and some other prey fishes. So, changes. The first one, warming. And I don't think we have to tell anybody that things are definitely changing out there, things are getting warmer. You heard the hatchery talk about their inability to get cold water and get fish with the right condition of egg. This is the mean annual temperature in degrees Fahrenheit from the Shoremont Water Treatment Center. This is a time series that our steam biologist uh, Bob Morgan here started. In fact, uh, we we'll started gathering from the uh, power station that really helps us understand. It's a great metric. It's collected down at about 45 feet. So it's not very, it doesn't respond to sort of the highs and the lows of you know, any given day. It's very sort of steady in that way, but it tracks that amazing pattern. What is about a three degree increase over the past 30 to 40 years? If we break that down and think about that at a, at a month scale, all months are warming, but some months are warming faster than others. The axis on the Y is how fast it's warming in a degree per year. So months like April, May, June, almost up to a tenth of a degree per month. One degree Fahrenheit every 10 years. So if you think about the biological processes of the fish and the fisheries, think about staging, when fish are staging, when fish are moving, you know, these are the things we're thinking about. What's actually driving the system? We often tend to think that we have a lot of control over aspects of this fishery. I remember my colleague, uh, Dr. Tom Stewart, used to use the slide, it's jungle out there, to really describe it. You know, it's something you think you have control over, but really a lot of these sort of big scale, ecosystem scale drivers are influencing a lot of the things that we're working on and looking at. Two things, one, we've also seen a nutrient decline, and the lake's gotten clear. I don't have to tell any of you this, you see it out there every day, but, um, you know, the nutrients have declined. Obviously, the Clean Water Act is a great thing. The Cuyahoga River on fire, not a great thing for, uh, for society. But the nutrients have declined. That arrow there marks when we saw really the big proliferation of Dracaena mussels. So while we saw the nutrients decline and water clarity increased, we saw the biggest change after the mussels came in. And while that Water clarity increase, that's the spring, April, Seki, this just sort of how we read, how clear the water is. The deeper we can, the deeper that value, the clearer the water. It's a lot more variable now. That depends on whether we took the reading after a big rain or not. But we can make years when we have no problem seeing that disc down at 20 meters in the spring. So it's a significant change from what things were back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Similarly, we talk about the mussels, the Dracaena mussels. Most people want to say zebra mussels, and there are zebra mussels out there, but 99.99% of them are actually the quagga mussel, a very close representative of a zebra mussel. And they went up really high in the early 2000s, but they've been steadily coming down. That's both sort of attributable to a usual boom and bust when a, a non-native species gets in, but also we had goby come in right around and really get abundant around 2005. And they're a, a big prey on, or a big predator on those Dracaena mussels. So we think about those things, those sort of big scale drivers, we know they have impacts on the alewife biology, 
but really how the ale life reacts in Lake Ontario is important for how we survey that. The first part is, we don't have to tell you, they're the dominant part of the prey fish. They make up the vast majority of all prey consumed by predators, but they also make up the vast majority of all the biomass in the lake. Our past three sort of whole lake estimates of that range anywhere between 89 to 94% of all the total weight out there is alewife. They prefer 52 to 66 degrees, and less than 38 is not good. There are species that would, uh, their native range in sort of the Atlantic Ocean is where they can regulate. As winters come, they would move south. They can't move south in like Ontario they, during winter. They need to find that warmer water, and over winter, that warmer water is on the lake bottom, right? Lakes freeze, you know, the coldest water's at the surface, and the densest, warmest water is on the lake bottom. Look at the picture of that, right? And so over winter, these fish, the lake's clearer now, so they need to hide from predators, but also stay in the warm water. Over winter, they're often found down the bottom, 300 feet or more, which is kind of fortunate because when we survey a life, it allows us to trawl, pull our bottom nets, our bottom trawls, along the lake bottom in April and catch those fish at all different depths. And so that, uh, the upper right hand corner there depicts sort of a bottom trawl on our net and our vessels out there fishing those trawls. But what's also important is the way we've expanded the survey, both through uh, questions and concerns by management and our better understanding of the data, as well as the vessel that the Ontario Ministry got we were able to actually put together a three-boat survey and expand what was from the historic survey of about 100 survey sites there in the traditional survey to now in 2017, we're doing a little over 200 sites on an entire lake scale, sampling from the shallowest, I think we get is five to six meters, so 15 feet or so, and the deepest is 225 meters, so we're over 700 feet. We also get some additional information from our July acoustics and our October bottom trawls, but those trawls are actually out there. We're looking for benthic fish at that time, sculpin and gobies and things like that. But when we catch alewife, we use the information from them, but that's not our main assessment survey for the season. Here's a couple pictures. That's Mike in the upper left and in the right, and Jeremy with the the largest catch actually ever landed in the first year that the Ontario boat was out there. That's Toronto there in the background. And you know, just to keep that in mind, it's, we talk about ale life declining. We don't mean there's no ale life. There's plenty of ale life. But really the concerns are about, are there the right number of ale life for the number of predators that we have out in the system? So this first graph, we can slow the buttons down here, is the adult abundance. Um, the index is on the right, so more higher, the higher that value is, the more ale life there are, and then time along the x-axis. And what we see here is there's some error associated with these estimates, right? So that's those, that sort of gray shading. In 2017, the adult ale life abundance increased substantially from 2016. The, uh, we actually think that 2016 value was probably the lowest value we've ever seen in this survey. Well, 2010 looks a little bit lower. We actually have good reason to understand that that survey had some biases. So, but the, all the data points to that 2016 number being the lowest we've ever seen. And if you followed some of these, the issues and the stocking reduction and the concerns about the ALA population sustainability, you'll understand why that concern is so important. Like I said, we do sample in Canadian waters, and the importance of that has really been magnified by just doing it in two years and getting an exact opposite result in those two years. So in 2016, those numbers were higher, that giant catch that I showed of Jeremy laying on the trawl. And then in 2017, the catch rates were much lower on that Canadian side. So we're not able to get quite the same sort of coverage we do in Canada, so we're still understanding how to interpret those trends, but we're quite happy to have that information 
to understand the late trends that unfold. 2016, here just shows us, shows where our catches, where our trawls were in the lake. A red point represents no ale bite. You see those are all associated with those shallow areas where the colder water is, the ale life are offshore and deeper. And the bubble size shows you how big the catch was. It's pretty easy if we contrast 2016 to 2017. There's just a lot more larger bubbles. The scale is the same size. Both there's more blue bubbles and the bubbles that are there are bigger. So we have a lot more fish, and obviously they were a lot stronger, more distributed on that South Shore, on the New York Shore. In contrast to the slight increase in the adults, the age one abundance was literally a record breaker. And off the charts number, we had to move the y-axis to get it on the graph. When I first plotted it, I thought I did something wrong because I didn't see the point. It was just actually above the graph limit. So what we saw here, the age one alewife in 2017 were born in 2016. We assess them one year later. So this was a record year class here in the New York waters. You can see these are the Canadian uh, numbers as well. They had a high number of alewife, age one alewife, but not nearly as high as the New York index. So this is this 2016 year class that we'll be talking about in these next slides as we talk about a year class. That's the year the alewife was born. We count them or measure how big they were the next year. So the other thing to point out here is as Jana mentioned, those two cold winters. That's 2013 and the 2014 year class. The 2014 year class was the lowest we've observed in the time series, almost actually non-existent. So you have a low year class next to a non-existent year class, and that's what caused the concern in terms of the sustainability of the population. If you remember, you might have seen this figure that we put out just to help folks understand what they're seeing when you're looking in the stomachs. We often hear people say, oh, the hatch was good. You know, I saw, I saw a good small ale life in June or July in the stomachs. Well, those were actually last year's ale life. You wouldn't be able to see this year's ale life until maybe August. Here, the fish on the far left side, they're one to two inches. Those were, that was the fish spawn in 20. In this case, it was a fish spawn in 2016. The year one fish are already five inches, and the adults are something like five, six, seven, even eight inches. That's important because these next couple of graphs, we're going to step you through how we sort of think about the size and the age and the year classes and how they're changing. And we put this together on the, the y-axis is the total number of fish, and on the horizontal axis, the vertical axis is the total number of fish, and on the horizontal axis is the size of the fish. So that's the bars, the height is the how many that are caught in these size ranges, and the color is the year class. So in this case, we're showing the catch of 2013, this is the 2012 year class, and then in subsequent slides, that color will stay the same as those fish get older and move through the slide. So basically, if you track the color, you're tracking a year class moving through the population. This is the last five years. So since the last big year class, which was the 2012 year class, we're tracking that through here to 2017. You know, careful, we can highlight that. That's the 2012 year class being caught as age one, two, three, four, Five. You can see in this case, they're making up the majority of the adult spawning size fish in the lake. In contrast to the black bars, the blue bars show you what happens in one of those colder winters. That's the 2013 year class. There were some out there as ones, not more as two, maybe caught a little bit better, but they didn't last long and there weren't nearly as many. Contrast that to 2014, they were almost absent, and they remain absent. 
can barely see the red bars in any of these figures. So when we talk about um, the stocking cuts and thinking about the resilience of this population, we had these two year classes that were missing here and here. It created this hole, and it also created, you don't see a lot of colors out here in the adults right now. So that was the concern that the managers had over will we have enough adults? Like the cuts we knew, these are the years that we were worried about. When, how long will these 2012 fish hold out as adults and continue making new fish? Yes, we had a great year class here in the 2016 fish, but it's these adult sized fish that we're concerned about and the fact that there are very few blue colors or red colors up there. Right, that's the, that's the record 2016. So what about 2017? Well, we know temperature is an important factor. multiple factors that go into understanding how well male life produces one year to the next. But no matter where we look in the Great Lakes, temperature is an incredibly important so we can look at two different indices. The first thing is, how warm was it in the spring? The warmer the spring or the earlier the spring, it tend to get better ale life reproduction. The less intense the winter, that following winter is, you tend to have better ale life survival. So the conditions for good year classes tend to be a warm and early spring, and then that followed by a relatively mild winter. Here's all the points um, from, these are the last 20 years of points that show where the spring temperature index was relative to the winter. So here we have springs where we had very warm temperatures in both spring and winter. And this is where they were both cool. If we look at the top six points, the top six, the top six largest year classes are shown there in the red. Those are the years that produce the most ale life. And those are the top six year classes that produce the fewest ale life. That helps us get some sort of understanding, again, not perfect, but understanding for where we are in 2017. Sort of more on that cold winter side as we have to plow our way just to get Again, not great, but stay tuned, right? This graph is not a great predictor. It's not a perfect predictor, but it helps give us, give us some idea. Other species, and we're gonna run through these fairly quickly. If you have other questions, don't feel free to ask us about them or, uh, or send us an email. Uh, rainbow smell numbers were down. They've typically been down and up over the past 20 years. We've, saw, we've seen that same decline that we saw in all species as the nutrient levels came down. Now they're bouncing around. Emerald shiners, three spines, sticklebacks. These are mentioned in the fish community objective as well as Cisco. Um, we put these up here just to give you a reference of what's happening with other species. Um, some might be following the, the, uh, the recent increase we saw in Cisco a few years ago. That actually hasn't persisted, so that was sort of 